Matthew chapter 3 and, uh, and Isaiah chapter 40. So if you want to find both of those and just kind of mark it with your finger, uh, th that we're going to be looking at, the, it's very similar text. So with that, uh, in Matthew chapter 3, let's look at the first three verses there and then uh, we'll pray. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Will y'all pray with me, dear Lord? I just ask that you would just help me this morning as I present your word, that I can, uh, that, uh, you know, my <clears throat> I feel my voice leaving me a little bit, so I pray, Lord, for the, that you would help me with uh, the words that I speak. Uh, ask the Lord that you continue to remember uh, definitely Brother Comer and Don Greenwood and and uh, Ka and Kathy Long's family, Lord, that you would just uh, be with them. I pray, Lord, that you would just have your hand over, you know, over, over our church here, Lord, that we may be able to bless you in the way that you would have us to, that you would just guide our hearts and our minds this morning as we receive your word, that you would just give us, give us the right understanding of what you would love for you, what you would have for your people to do. So guide us, Lord, in these things and this understanding. May we be filled with your spirit and led by your spirit in all in all these ways. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So here we have John the Baptist. You know, we've been preaching through Matthew, uh, through the book of Matthew, and we pause for a little bit to, you know, for for talk about the temple, but here we are back in Matthew, and we get to this point where it, we're introduced to John the Baptist, and it says that John the Baptist he came preaching in the wilderness, and he and he is this he is this voice uh, that the that the scripture foretold, or at least is he, you know, John, John at least reaches for this because when they ask John who he is. He says, I am, the, I am a voice crying in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. And when you see the, some of the stuff that he says, he says, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And I think that that's a very important message because how do you, because what really is this voice? What's the motivation behind this voice? And I think we could see that in Isaiah chapter 40. If you'll turn to Isaiah chapter 40 with me. We're going to start at verse 3 of Isaiah chapter 40. Listen to what this scripture says. It says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness. That sounds very familiar, doesn't it? We just read it in John. So Matthew reaches back there. He reaches, get, grabs this verse and he plugs it in. And he says, Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for God. So this is, this is what was Isaiah, he, he gives this, this mentality of, of a voice that's, that's crying out in the wilderness because he's, why, and why would this voice be crying? Well, think about what John the Baptist is doing. He knows, that G, he knows that the Messiah is about to come on the scene, and he is preparing the way for the people to receive the Messiah. Y'all didn't tell me I wasn't on. How's that? Is that better? All right, now y'all can hear me. <coughs> Now you can hear me. Yeah, sorry about that. I forgot. I forgot. I, I wasn't on. Here we go. So John, John is crying out of the wilderness because he knows that Christ is there or Christ is coming, about to present himself. And we see this motivation coming from Isaiah chapter 40. We're going to look at we're going to we're going to hang around Isaiah 40 and we're going to because the rest of the scriptures here give us the heart that's kind of behind this. Who is this voice crying out in the wilderness? Well, first off, John had, this is the heart that John had. And this is, and whenever you look at people, do you have the heart that John the Baptist had? Can you imagine? When John the Baptist saw people walking by and he would cry, repent, what do you think that, what do you think that, that means? Do you think that means that, you know, he's judging them because they're sin, in living in sin? Or is he looking at those people and he's saying, you need to repent because you need a Savior. 
You need a Savior. And that's the heart that Isaiah chapter 40 reveals to us, is one who needs a Savior. When, you look, when John the Baptist came, that's what he was doing. And I think that that heart that John the Baptist had, that it's supposed to be taken up by us. It is a mantle that's supposed to be carried. That's why John says, I'm nobody. I'm just a voice. I'm crying out in the wilderness. I'm crying to people. You need a savior. Your sins are going to take you to hell. And I don't want you to go there. I want you to be like that last song we sang on Sweet Hour Prayer. That whenever you reach the, the tip of Mount Pisgah, that you can look up because your redeemer is taking you home. And you reach that eternal reward. That's what John saw. That's what his heart was. That's the heart. Now, whenever you see this, if you have that heart, you know, who, who does God want to have that heart? He wants every believer to have that same heart. He wants every believer to be that voice. I want to show you something. If you'll just flip a couple pages in Isaiah, back to the left, to Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah chapter 6. I just want to read a couple verses to you, starting at verse 8. Isaiah, he, you know, this is, Isaiah's writing this. He says, I'm a voice too, but here he, he, he hears the call from God. He says, I also, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? And who will go for us? You know, that voice, God is calling to all his people. And he cries out and he calls to you. He says, who will, who will hear my voice? Who will go for us? And Isaiah, he hears the voice. And he says, here am I. Send me. How many believers, they hear that voice. But they're like, no, I'm not, I'm not ready to go anywhere. Isaiah, he says, I hear the voice. Hear him, my Lord. He raises his hand and he says, send me. And God says to him, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not. See ye indeed, but perceive not. You see, the people that we're giving the message to. They can hear us with their ears, but they don't understand the words that we're saying. They can even see that there's a Savior, but they can't really see their need. Isn't it interesting that they don't see their needs? That they need a Savior. John the Baptist, he looks at people and he says, I see your need, but the people living, they don't see their need. They're blind to what the real need is. They think, well, I need... You know, I need my luxuries. I need to fulfill the lust of my flesh. I need to do this. I need a good job. I need a good house. I need to eat well. And, the, and they're surrounded with all those things. But John looks, he says, you need so much more than that. Because Jesus would even say it like this. What good would it do if you should gain the whole world and yet lose your own soul? You know, what good does it do... Uh, Putin to gain Ukraine and then die and go to hell. Would that do him any good? What good would it do us to stop him if our in our country our people die and they go to hell? You, you, you understand the heart behind Isaiah here? He says, are you really listening to God's call? You could gain whatever it is that you want in this world. But if you lose your soul, you gained nothing. You, in fact, you lose everything. The kids that you fought, that you're fighting so hard to make sure that they have all their needs met. If you do not take them and lead them and tell them about their Savior, you're going to lose them. In your greatest attempt to save them, in fact, you lose them. Do you hear the voice that Isaiah heard. He says, make the heart of this people fat and make their ears heavy and shut their eyes. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert. You see, when they when they really hear, they understand and they see with their eyes and they get it. He says it's going to affect their heart. 
And when they truly understand, God says they'll convert. They'll cling to me. They'll reach to their Savior. And then Isaiah says, how long? How long, Lord, do you want me to have this heart? How long do you want me to have a heart like John the Baptist had? He says, until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land utterly desolate. And the Lord have removed men far away and there be a great forsaking in the midst of the land. How long are we supposed to have this heart? Until there's nobody left. Until there's nobody left. Are you that voice crying out in the wilderness? Have you heard the voice of the Lord? Do you have that heart to say, I'm going to I'm going to prepare the way of the Lord and I'm going to reach and I'm going to I'm going to let God use me to reach out into a lost generation until there's nobody left to reach. That's the heart. That's the motivation behind this voice crying out in the wilderness. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. What does that mean? That means to help others turn towards God. You prepare the way by helping others turn towards God. Now, some of those ways are very mysterious that we don't even fully understand. You know how you do it right? You be led by the Spirit, as, as Paul speaks of in Romans be led by that spirit. And God will use you to prepare the way for people. Are there people in your life that you're praying for? You know, I've got a list of folks that I, that I pray for. And uh, there's been some that I've, I pray for. I'm like, God, what would it take to bring them to you? Um, I have been really surprised on some of the ways that God has used uh, me to... Help people get back right with him where they would start going to church. They'd start reading their Bible again. They'd start praying. And uh, not all of it is, uh, is positive things, by the way. Some of it is severed friendships. And I'm like, why, why would that happen? Why would that be the reason that somebody would go back to church? I had no idea. I had no idea. God's ways are higher than my ways. But at the end of the day, what really matters is... Is their eternal destination? If God can use a severed friendship to get them back, then I guess that's what I that's what I will accept, even though I may not like it and it's really uncomfortable at the time. Because I want to prepare the way somehow. Now, what is the way that we're talking about? Well, when we look at the way in the scripture, we're talking about a road. It's a journey, your journey of life, their journey. How do you prepare that? Or how do you understand that? Well, you need to understand it as a believer like this. Jesus is the way. There's no other way. If, you try, if you're trying to get to heaven through some other direction, through some other road, through some other path, you're not going to get there. You're going to go somewhere else. You know, if you're trying to head to Little Rock, but you go north, you're never going to get to Little Rock. You just, it's just not going to happen. You've got to go the right way. Well, the right way to heaven is through Jesus. Are you following those road signs? He is the way, the truth, and the life. No man is coming unto the Father except through him. In Proverbs chapter 3 and 6, the scripture says, In all thy ways acknowledge him. We're just not talking about the why you do certain things. We're talking about your direction of life. In all of your directions, acknowledge him. What are your dreams? Do your dreams acknowledge God? What are your ambitions? Do your ambitions acknowledge God? In all your ways, acknowledge him. And this is what the scripture says. He will direct your path. There's so many people out there, they, they talk like, I don't know the direction that God would have me to do. Well, you, you want to know why you don't know your the direction? Because you're not acknowledging him in all your ways. You're not going to go down the right path of life, and you're always going to feel lost when you refuse to acknowledge the one who's supposed to direct your path. 
And you know what? When you, if you don't acknowledge God, you know what will happen? You will choose your own way. I find it interesting in Proverbs that it says the, the, the fool is the one who, said, who has to find themselves. But God's people, God directs them because they're acknowledging him in all of their ways. Now, if that way includes the voice, which it very much should, it should include the voice of him crying out in the wilderness. If you become that voice, we see what happens in the book of Acts. That, that voice makes a stir. It may cause a few problems. When Paul got to Ephesus and he preaches the way, he preaches Jesus Christ. He preaches that there's no other way to be saved but through Jesus Christ. Well, it caused a stir. In fact, he ended up having to leave the city. It caused a riot in the city. And some of the leaders started becoming afraid because the Romans are going to come and take us over because you guys are being crazy. Because they believe that Diana was a good enough way. The problem is Diana was a wrong way. Unless you wanted to go to death and destruction, then Diana would lead you straight there. But if, you, but if you're seeking life everlasting, you have to go the way of Jesus. Now that way takes you straight through the cross. And John the Baptist, he, 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 he's capturing Isaiah chapter 40 here. If you want to turn back to, to Isaiah 40, make sure you're there. He says in verses 3, the end of verse 3 and verse 4, it says, Make straight. In the desert of highway for our God. Now straight means to be fitted, leveled out. Let me ask you something. Do you know the way? Do you know the way? Are you familiar with the way? Like if somebody came to you and says, could you show me the way to be saved? Could you show that to them? You should be able to. As a believer, you must know the way. How else are you going to be a voice crying out like John was? How are you going to be able to have that heart if you do not know and understand the way yourself? The way to God should not be hard or complicated. It doesn't have to be. You know, we try to, we try to make it that way sometimes, and it's confusing. People are like, oh, goodness, you know, how many, how many verses do I got I to gotta know? I'm going to break it down real simple for you. The way to God is not hard. It's simple. Believe Jesus that he is who he says he is. You all agree with that? You've got to believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And he did what he said he would do. Well, who is Jesus? Well, he's the son of God. What does that mean? That means in, in 1 Timothy 3.16 that God was manifest in the flesh. That God took on a body to die for our sins. We believe that he is who he says he is. Jesus even said that I, he, when they asked him who he was, he said, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. We're talking about the guy who met Moses in the burning bush. Who was that guy? The Lord, angel of the Lord. Well, who's the angel of the Lord? Well, he's the person who, offer, who, who is in the office of the Son. When did the office of the Son happen? It didn't happen when Jesus was born to Mary. It happened way back in the beginning when God looked upon the voidness of the universe and he said, let there be. That voice was Jesus Christ before his name was Jesus Christ. He's the one by whom all things consist, the scripture says, and by him uh, was not anything made that was made. Jesus is that voice. We just didn't know him as, you just didn't know him as Jesus Christ. But you know what's amazing? Is it the name Jesus Christ? This is for free. It's not in my notes. It's always been who it was in the Old Testament. You know what, you know what Jesus' name is? Yeshua. You know what Yeshua is in the Old Testament? It's Joshua. And it means, and it's in the Hebrew, it's Yeshua, it means salvation. And you'll see several places in the Old Testament where it says the Lord is what? My salvation. The Lord has always been Jesus. Even in the Old Testament. Yeah, it's a little bit of wordsmithing going on, but it all means the same. We just have to backtrack. But, it, but Jesus has always been who he was. Just like Revelation says. 
the one who was and is and is to come. He was salvation. He is salvation. And he will always be salvation. And there's only one road that you can go down to get to him. The way of Jesus. The way of the cross. You've got to believe who he says he is. And you've got to believe the, the, the gospel. And the, the 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 4, gives us a, a good uh, summary of what the gospel is. How that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures. And that he was buried and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. What does that mean? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the gospel in a nutshell. You must believe that. You've got to believe the gospel. If you believe anything else, you're believing a different gospel. And there is no other gospel. The scripture says anybody who believes another gospel is anathema. They're a curse. They're headed straight to hell. Don't follow those people. Follow the Jesus of the Bible and what he did with the gospel that's mentioned there. And then you have Romans 10, 9 that says it like this. When you believe those things in your heart, confess them with your mouth. That's what he, that's what he says. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and shalt believe in thy heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is how you follow the way. Do you know the way? If you don't know that way, then I don't know what way you know, but this is the way that you need to know. I sound like I'm getting all confused. I'm not confusing anybody with saying way so much, am I? Don't let that get in the way. Follow the way. And you know what you'll see? You'll see more motivators. When you're following the way, you'll look around and you see the glory of God everywhere you see god working in the minute and also the most complicated things look at isaiah 40 and verse 5 it says and the glory of the lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the lord hath spoken it the glory of god is everywhere as a believer can you testify to that if you see god everywhere say amen, amen. man god's everywhere Man, I have to, you have to try not to see what he's doing. It's like you have to purposely put blinders on your eyes so that you can't see where God is working. Isaiah 6 and 3, he says, And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The glory of God is everywhere. And as a believer, as a voice, just like John that when you see that glory, you got to tell somebody about it. This is what God's been doing for me. This is how he's working in my life. I can look back at years ago and I can see what was going on there. And now God has just moved so much. And now I went from there to there. When I look back, I don't even recognize that person. Who is that person? Well, they look like me. They sound like me. But that's not me. That's not who I am anymore. I'm something different. Why? Because the glory of God got a hold of you. And you were born again. And you were changed. That you're not the person that you used to be. You're different. That's what born again looks like. That's what the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, that's what they experienced. The glory of God changing their life. Habakkuk 2.14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the glory of the Lord. As the waters cover the sea. As a witness to what Jesus is doing in your life. When you go to witness to somebody. You don't have to know everything in this scripture. All you have to do is look around. And you know what you'll often find? If you'll listen to those people that need a savior. They will tell you by accident how God is working in their life, how he's trying to reach them, how they don't understand why they're trying so hard and things keep falling apart. And you can tell them that's because you're trying to do it your way and not Jesus way. You want to walk down your own path and not the path that God has laid before you to know the Savior. If you would just follow the Savior, you would find he would direct your path. And all these things that you're failing at, all of a sudden, God would rearrange all those things. That's the glory of God in a person's life. And as a believer, I witnessed that. I, I could testify to that. 
And because of that, that should motivate you to want to be that voice of one crying out. Look at verses 6 and 7 here in chapter 40 of Isaiah. The voice said, cry. And he said, what shall I cry? Here's, what, here's a message. If you're like, I don't know what to say. Here's your message. All flesh is grass and all goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth and the flower fadeth away because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. Look at the first part of verse 8. The grass, or we'll come back to verse 8. We'll come back to that. What is the message? Every person is appointed unto death. That is a reason to cry. Because when you look at the people that you care about so much, one day they're going to die. And what, is it, and what do we know about that? After death is the judgment. That's what the scripture says. It is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. So when I look at people, I, you know, I'll... I, you need to look at, if you're going to be this voice, you need to look at folks and you need to say, they are somebody that's going to judgment. And I don't want them standing at judgment alone. Anybody want to do that? You ever, I don't know if you've ever had to go, go to court or something, and you have to stand, you have to stand in judgment. I can remember in the military that there was a couple of times that we would go in and we would, you know, they were trying to teach us how to, how to go before judgment, Right. You know, when you get in trouble with your commander, you got to go stand before him and, and you would come and you'd salute. And, you, and I would say, like, you know, Sergeant Doss reports his order. Sir, you know what? I'd have to do that. I'd have to learn to report. You remember doing those things, Brother Bob? You don't remember? He never got in trouble. Now, this guy was a little different story. There was a couple of times that I got to, I got to exercise that. It was never comfortable when you're standing and you know why you're there. You are being judged for something that you did. Well, every life is going to stand at that time and they are going to report it is ordered. You must be there and you are going to give an account of yourself. And I recognize that in every single person. That voice crying out in the wilderness recognizes everyone is appointed unto that judgment and they're going to be there alone. I tell you what, there's a couple times that I had a buddy with me and I felt a whole lot better about the situation. Especially when they spoke on my behalf and they told the commander it wasn't his fault. It was someone else's. Sometimes they even said it was my fault when they stood there. And that's who Jesus, the way is for you. As a believer, you don't face that judgment alone. You have an intercessor. Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, comes in beside you. And when you're being judged and the books are opened and you're having to give an account of yourself. And the intercessor comes in and says, I've paid their price. They are innocent. They are guiltless. All of their crimes and all of their wrongs, they've been washed by me, by my blood. They've been taken care of by me. You see, when you stand there, there's nothing that you can do. There's nothing that you can say that's going to relieve you of that judgment. But when Jesus comes in, there is something that he can say and there is something that he's done. He died on the cross for your sins. He shed his blood so that your sins could be washed white as snow. And you know what he's going to say? When he steps up, he's going to say, This Mitch belongs to me. Mitch is my son. Mitch understood what I did for him on the cross. He's mine. And I give him part of my inheritance. Joint heirs with Jesus Christ, the scripture says. 
Do you know the way? You don't want to stand in judgment alone. You want to stand there with the intercessor. And the intercessor wants to stand there with you. How do you get that intercessor with you? You believe. You believe that Jesus is who he says he is. And because of that, I will be that voice crying out. Because all flesh is grass. We see that from Peter. Peter says that too. He says, for all flesh is grass. The glory of man is going to fade. One day they're going to, they're going to meet their maker. I hope you can meet your maker knowing that you've got an intercessor that's going to be beside you. I hope that when you get there, you're not thinking, well, I've done enough good. I've done a lot of good. Maybe that'll be enough. It won't be enough, by the way. There, you just cannot do anything that's good enough. Your, the scripture says your righteousness is as a filthy rag. You need the righteousness of Christ on your life. That motivates me to be a voice crying in the wilderness. Look at verse 8 as we, fit, as we wrap this up. It says the grass withereth. Yep, you're going to wither. Your body is going to dry up. It's going to wrinkle up. It's going to fade away. It's going to die one day. But look what this says. But the word of our God shall stand for how long? Forever. Forever. First Peter 1.25 says it like this. But the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Do you understand what that means? It's like John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believed in him would not perish, but what? Have everlasting life. Jesus Christ died for you so that you could have everlasting life. His word stands forever. That promise is forever. If you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you've confessed him with your mouth. You believed in your heart. You've accepted his gospel. You accept who he is. You are saved. You believe it. That word abides forever. It will never fail. Will never fail. Psalms 119, 89 through 91. Look what it says. Forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Thy faithfulness is unto all generation. Thou hast established the earth and it abideth. When Jesus Christ died for your sins... And you have been born again. He says, you are no longer of your father, the devil, but you are of a different breed of person. You have become a son of God. That's what first. That's what John chapter one tells us, that those who believe in him to them gave you power to become the sons of God. And that includes daughters, too. That includes daughters, too. Your joint heirs. That word abideth forever. Hey, death is temporary. You know what the scripture says? There's the promise. And this is part of the word. He's going to give you a new body. Yeah, you have to go through the, phys the physical and, and the spiritual change. But your soul does not die. Your soul was created eternal. But this body... Is not eternal. But God's going to give you one that's eternal. He's going to give you one that's fixed of all the ailments and the problems. You know, Brother Comers, he's dealing, he's dealing with some of the problems of, of this body today. But one day, God's going to give him a new body. That's not going to have those problems. It's not going to need a surgery to fix. And by the way, the surgery is just temporary. But God's going to do something permanent. And he's going to permanently... Give him a new body that will not have those problems ever, ever again. That word abideth forever. Now, if you're, if you're struggling today with some pains and suffering, you, man, you should be like, amen to me, like crazy. Because God's got something better for you. And that word endureth forever. The flower is going to fade. But God's got something better. He's got something better. Do you know the way? Are you that voice? Do these things motivate you to cry into the wilderness, to tell others, listen, I know what's going to happen. I know how the end works. And there's something better coming.
Yeah, we've all got to go through the, through the waters. We all got to go through the, through the sea. But when we come out on the other, other side, we'll be in the promised land. That word abideth forever. Brother Sean and Isaac, would you come? Dear Lord, I just want to ask that you will just guide us in, in a better understanding of your word. That we, will, that we will be able to have the heart that John the Baptist had. That when we see others in this world, that we will be that voice crying out in the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. Lord, there's so many folks around here, they do not know the way. Lord, would you help us to show them the way that you will guide our own understandings, that in all of our ways that we would, uh, that we would acknowledge you and allow you to direct our paths. And Lord, let that path lead us to some people that need a Savior. They all need a Savior. Help us, Lord, to recognize that need and to share with them Jesus who died for their sins, who rose again the third day, and who's coming back again. Guide us in all these things in this understanding. Help us to be that voice, crying out of, in, crying out of the wilderness, preparing the way of the Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.